This is um, the first year of Paradigm. This is our second summer school. I think that uh, we have one person who came to our first summer school over here, Celeste. That was two weeks ago on bulk crystal growth. But this um, summer school, as you know, is an introduction to density functional theory for experimentalists. So it's meant to be, you, have, you're not, you don't need any prerequisite knowledge in this technique. You do, of course, need to know something about science. <laughs> okay, which, which, which you do. So I'd like, to, I'd like to, uh, to welcome you. The summer school lectures will start tomorrow. All of the theory lectures will be given by Feliciano Guistino from the University of Oxford. He's written a text on this. Uh, he teaches it to third year undergraduates at Oxford. All of you will get the text tomorrow along with his detailed notes that he's prepared for this uh, week long course. But I would like to spend a few minutes telling you about what paradigm is. And um, so in a, in, a, in a nutshell, it's um, what I would call materials by design. It's, um, a, it's part of the materials genome initiative. I'll tell you more about that in just a second. But uh, this $25 million platform in NSF lingo is a national user facility. So uh, it's more than just summer schools. Summer schools are to, to uh, help, help us create a, a, uh, a knowledgeable base of users that want to actually discover new materials. This is all about materials by design. And theory, of course, is an important part of materials by design, as is synthesis and characterization. Um, this uh, materials by design differs from what you might think of or know how many materials have been discovered in the past. So here's a nice, uh, a nice cartoon about, um, it's, it seems like a joke, doesn't it? But in, in reality, this is the way many materials have been di discovered, including materials like penicillin, Teflon, Viagra, Play-Doh, posted adhesives, and the latest blue pigment. So this is Master Brahmanian's discovery. Um, and he made a very nice blue pigment. It, um, it's, a, it's rare to have such stability in a blue color. It uh, also absorbs relatively little heat. Um, but what was he trying to make? He was trying to make a new multiferroic uh, that was actually predicted by Nicholas Spalden. And instead, he didn't make the multiferroic, but he formed a, a different phase. And, and instead of throwing it away, he recognized, wow, that's a really nice color of blue, and has patented it. And now it's being, it's being uh, made as a commercial pigment. pigment. Well, that's one way of materials discovery, but that's not the, uh, the vision of the Materials Genome Initiative um, or of, of Paradigm. So the issue of materials discovery is so important that uh, our president has been talking about it. In fact, five years ago, President Obama launched this initiative. And the key idea of the initiative is to discover and bring to market materials more rapidly. Uh, recognizing that uh, technologic technology depends on new materials, new materials with advanced properties. What you may not recognize is that the nation has poured $500 million into this program over the last five years. Um, we're the very end of that initial investment. Um, in fact, the, the, um, the White House is having, in, in, in two weeks, the White House is having a five-year anniversary of this materials genome, genome initiative. And um, as part of our new facility here, I've been invited to go to the White House to hear about you know, all the great things that have happened in the Materials Genome Initiative. But it's really aimed at, at discovering new materials more quickly. So what is Paradigm? Um, well, the, the acronym, you know, it's the Platform for the Accelerated Realization, Analysis, and Discovery of Interface Materials. The key word there being accelerated discovery of new materials. In NSF lingo, it's, an, it's a platform. That's the P of, of paradigm. NSF has different levels of uh, national facilities. You may have used the Magnet Lab, or you may have used CHESS here at, at Cornell. Synchrotrons, or it's, it's Cornell, I mean, uh, NSF has one synchrotron. DOE has many. But this is an example of a national facility. Those are large-scale facilities, the Magnet Lab and the synchrotron. Uh, Mid-scale facilities are things that have not existed before in NSF lingo, but these new materials innovation platforms, of which we are the first, uh, we, are one of the, we are one of the first two 
NSF announced two of these in the, in the initial competition. We have one that's Paradigm, and there's one that's at, uh, at Penn State called the, called the 2DCC. Um, at any rate, these are, these are mid-scale uh, user facilities. Specifically, what Paradigm is, is it's a user facility for theory, bulk crystal growth, thin film crystal growth, and electron microscopy. Three of these four national user facilities are already open, and the fourth will open next year for thin film crystal growth. I'll tell you more about this in just, in just a second. So that's the part that's for users from across the nation. It also has uh, a research component that's internal to, to Paradigm, and that's focused more narrowly, instead of being broadly on electronic materials like it is for all the national users, our in-house focus is on the field of Valleytronics. And a key aspect for users in the USA is that this paradigm is free to uh, highly ranked proposals. So um, if you're thinking of discovering a new material, we would love to have you discover it within paradigm. We'd love to make your dreams come true. Um, be being that this is just, just starting, it's a great time to submit a proposal. These are two page proposals. I'll tell you about it, about it in a minute. Uh, we do have, I think we have three proposals that have actually made it through the review process now, but it's a great time to get in so that you can uh, get time in the facilities. So let me tell you about those four facilities, three of which are open right now. One is on theory. So this summer school is dedicated to theory, but we do have um, a user facility that's, that's uh, web-based that offers support in two different forms to users. One form is what I would call the consultation form where they, you, 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 you want to know what kind of code you should use. They can suggest code. Maybe you're having some, some problems with the input file. They'll give you advice. The advice can be via emails, over the phone, et cetera. Uh, maybe you really are an experimentalist, and even the, you take, though you've taken this week-long summer school, so you have some idea what theory can do, you'd like to work collaboratively with a pro at theory. Okay, that's also possible. In that, in that case, the, your collaborator would become a co-author on your publication. So both of those are, are, are possible. It's more than theory, though. It's also bulk crystal growth. Two weeks ago, we had a uh, summer school at Johns Hopkins University where the bulk crystal growth paradigm user facility is. And um, there, there's an, uh, a, a, a wealth of different techniques, Tchaikovsky, floating zone, uh, chemical vapor transport, Bridgman, to make single crystals, particularly of inorganic uh, materials. The thin film facility will open next year. Um, that facility will have as its signature tool this unusual combination of, of um, uh, photo emission, so angle resolved photo emission, coupled to metal organic chemical vapor deposition, coupled to molecular beam epitaxy. And what you may, may, um, may not recognize, or may or may not recognize, is that these two have never been coupled before, ever. So if you're looking to, to, to uh, if you're a theorist and you want to know, you know if your theory is, is, is good for predicting a material, one of the things that many theories calculate is what the band structure looks like, and that's what uh, angle resolve photo emission can measure. So if you're making a, a particularly a layered material by chemical vapor deposition, you'd like to be able to look at that pristine surface with, uh, with ARPAs. This will also be connected with molecular beam epitaxy so that making it possible to make thin film heterostructures that combine oxides with two-dimensional two uh, uh, dichalcogenides. It's also an electron microscopy facility. That's open now. Um, lots of uh, leading edge TEMs. This, this user facility is here at Cornell. And um, I just you know, pointed out the, the uniqueness of some of this and what it can do in terms of, of eels. So electron energy loss spectroscopy to chemically see where the atoms are. So in making a new material, maybe you have some idea from theory of where to put the atoms. You use some synthesis technique to try to get the atoms in, th in those positions, but then you'd like to see if the atoms really are in those positions, and that's where electron microscopy can come in. It's more than, than, than those new user facilities. Uh, Paradigm also allows access to a lot of existing facilities here at Cornell as well as at Johns Hopkins. So even though these facilities are not, um, you know, things like the Cornell Nanos, the, the CNF, the Cornell Nanoscale uh, Fabrication Facility, the Cornell um, CCMR, um, Center for Materials Research, thank you, with all of their analytic uh, capabilities and abilities to pattern films, those might be part of your proposed project. Maybe you want to make a new material and maybe you want to also pattern it 
into uh, some sort of a structure that you can make measurements on. Maybe it'll transport measurements, maybe optical measurements. All that can be part of your proposal, and it can all become free if you're, you know, within your umbrella that you've proposed to do makes use of other facilities that's all, that will all be covered. Okay, so it leverages these existing uh, facilities in addition to the theory, synthesis, and characterization, new facilities that I just talked about. So I'm, I'm almost done, but I want to I describe a little bit about what makes materials by design different from the serendipitous materials discovery that has occurred in the past. And um, I think I'm, maybe I'm the, one of the, maybe I'm the oldest in the room. So I can, I can tell you from my perspective, uh, 28 years ago when I started synthesizing materials by, by molecular beam epitaxy, um, the technique that, uh, that, that, that I used together with my collaborators, which is what, what I would call a fishing expedition. Um, you know, you have some idea that maybe, maybe by substituting something for something else, you might be able to make a more interesting uh, material. Um, but, but that, you know, with that kind of approach, uh, you might be able to catch a small fish. But as what, what worked for me, and this really changed my life about a dozen years ago, was when I started not only listening to theorists, but also talking to them. And um, maybe, maybe you're a theorist, and the opposite direction of communication can happen. But it makes it much more, uh, um, it, it, it really broadens things when you have a map to look for interesting new materials as opposed to cash, casting your fishing line in random directions. So that's part of the materials by design. Uh, of course, another key part is even if you have a great idea of where to put the atoms and you think you have a technique that can get them there, you need to see if they really are in those positions and what the resulting band structure is. So that's what is, is being shown by this loop. This loop is not uh, a fishing expedition. It's not serendipitous materials discovery. It's materials discovery with a purpose. You had some idea. Maybe you used theory to get started, but by s having an idea where to put the atoms and getting them in those positions, seeing that they really are in those positions, and then seeing what the underlying band structure of the material is and its underlying properties, that feedback can more rapidly get you toward the material that you want to discover. That's what Materials by Design is all about, and that's what our new national facility is all about that we call Paradigm. And um, so those of you that are younger, I hope that you just grow up not doing serendipity, but thinking about Materials by Design. So we really want you, within Paradigm, we want you to start thinking together, talking to each other, um, thinking more broadly than just your narrow field. I mean, Materials by Design is all fields. It's a very broad, and it's a very challenging thing to be talking to people that, where you don't share a common vocabulary with. What our dream is as a center is that five years from now, when we come up for renewal, we will be able to brag about materials discovery and these loops of materials innovation that are happening all over the country that we've helped catalyze. Okay, so that's what uh, paradigm is. Let me, let me now say a few words about the different types of paradigm proposals that can be written. These are the first type is to access the facilities. These are the two-page proposals that I was talking about. And by submitting a two-page proposal, um, it'll, it'll go out to our team of external reviewers. Our external reviewers are pros at discovering new materials. Um, we've deliberately chosen people that are not affiliated with any of our institutions and are um, not only well-known for materials discovery, but are, maybe, that's the right word, um, older. Um, you know, retired <laughs> or close to it because we don't want them to steal your ideas. So we wanted to pick people that really are pros at materials discovery um, but are not so hungry that they're going to, you know, look at your proposed idea and go, wow, I can make that, you know, in my lab and that kind of thing. So um, we, have a, we, have, we have experts. All proposals will be reviewed by, by three uh, of, these, of these experts. And the highest ranked ones will get free access to the facility. So you'll be communicated... Um, how, many, how many weeks of, of access you get in, in the different facilities, you know, depending upon what, what you've proposed. You have up to a year to use up that time. If, it may be that that's not enough time, and, and, but after, after using up the time, you can then write another two-page proposal and say, okay, this is how far I've gotten, and I'm, you know, I'm just on the brink of, of making this big breakthrough. If I only had you know, another couple of weeks, I think I could really make it, or you know, whatever, the, whatever it is, and then it goes back to review. So that's the, that's the one, one process. The, um, the other process is for materials that have been discovered within Paradigm. 
So once one of you discovers a new material, uh, you got to make it for free. But your recipe on the equipment within Paradigm is recorded. And that recipe then becomes publicly available, not only to other users that want to come to our facility, but somebody could um, write a proposal and say, hey, I, want, I really want to, want to uh, use that, I want to make that new material that was discovered within Paradigm. And instead of them asking you for the samples that you made, we will have what we call Paradigm interns use your recipe, your optimized conditions, to make samples to send to other people. Okay? Now, this is not to scoop you in any way. So as you, know, in, as you discover your, your material, you, uh, we will, um, your, your recipes stay secret until you publish. Once you publish, it becomes public uh, information. Okay? So, or or if, you, if, you, if you say you lose interest, okay, and you stop, you stop using the facility, okay, you've given up on it, then one year, one year after you've stopped doing anything, then whatever you tried will become public information. So the conditions that you use, the x-ray diffraction patterns, et cetera, that will become public information. Um, so if you see a material that was discovered here, you can write, uh, instead of a two-page pr proposal, you can simply request the material, and that will get made within Paradigm and sent to you by one of our Paradigm interns. I mentioned the proposal review process. It's a, it's a rolling process. There are no deadlines. Every proposal is reviewed by three of our, of our, of our experts. Uh, we guarantee a four-week turnaround. Um, and so, so uh, you know, quickly you can become, uh, come and use the, 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 uh, the facilities. Uh, the review criteria are aligned with materials by design. You can see all of this on our, on our webpage. Um, to summarize, Paradigm is a new national user facility. It uh, has a theory user facility to help guide experiment. It has, on the synthesis side, uh, high pressure crystal growth techniques. So the highest pressure that's ever been done by, by floating zone will, will uh, be available in Johns Hopkins uh, within, within a year as part of our crystal growth facility. Has a signature tool on the thin film side of, um, of this MOCVD, MBE, ARPAS uh, connectivity. And on the TEM side, it has unique new instruments, including a new detector that can map quantitatively uh, electric and magnetic fields with sub-nanometer resolution. It's all two-page two proposals. The, every summer we'll have two summer schools. So um, next summer we will also have a bulk crystal growth summer school as well as an electron microscopy summer school. The electron microscopy summer school will be June 19th through 23rd here at Cornell. Um, so this summarizes what I've, what I've, what I've told you about, uh, about Paradigm. It's, it's brand new. Uh, we would love for you not only to enjoy the summer school, we would love for you to help get the word out and to think about what new material you want to discover um, and hopefully come back and use our facilities to, to make it. I've told you a lot about Paradigm. Let me end with a slide about the other NSF materials innovation platform that was uh, funded at the same time as us. That's um, the 2D Crystal Consortium at Penn State, which focuses on uh, transition metal dichalcogenides. And um, here I show their signature tools, and they also have a web page. Any questions? OK, question? Is there a question? Yeah. OK. Julie? Oh. <laughs> I, may, I may fail. So let me give you this. Just say something. Hi. Can you? Yeah. Okay. Good. Just try not to drop the microphone. <laughs> yes, you have a presentation. I do. So let me introduce um, Julie Nucci, who is our director of education and outreach uh, within Paradigm, and she has done uh, a tremendous amount of organization. Um, to make this summer school possible. And she's now going to tell you about what you're going to be doing for the next five days. Okay.
Karen Jordan has done a tremendous amount of organization to make this summer school possible as well. So credit, uh, given where credit's due. So you just got the, the paradigm overview. And so now we'll kind of narrow down to the summer school overview. And for very, very boring logistics, we'll just kind of start quickly with the stuff in your folder and just go over the way things are going to work today. So if we just kind of start with schedule, it's a very mundane information. I'm sorry about that, but I thought it's better if everybody knows off the bat how we're going to run. So we're going to have the same basic format every day where there'll be two morning theory lectures and then a practical lecture and then hands-on sessions and then dinner and then an evening activity that's going to be based on the team-based problem solving. And I'll talk about that a little bit later. So breakfast will be in Clark Hall. So if you don't want to get up extra early, then you can stroll in shortly before the first talk starts and eat breakfast and drink coffee as you're listening to the talks. Lunch, we will walk every day, a short walk on campus, nothing like the walk you had this evening, <laughs> to, to get to lunch. And we'll go to the same place every day for lunch. And dinners will be in different restaurants in College Town. Uh, so we'll get some movement. I, the thought of staying in Clark Hall from 9.30 in the morning till 9 o'clock at night sounded uh, pretty awful to me. So we'll get you outside. You have a big lunch break if you want to explore campus a little or do other things and some time between when the afternoon session ends and, and dinner starts. This in here is just a little map to tell you how to get to Clark. It's uphill. You start uphill, but it's all downhill when you come home. Uh, this is just dinners. So we go Indian, Middle Eastern, Korean, Japanese. I hope that works for everybody. If not, maybe be really brave and try something new. And the last sheet is this, which is with respect to the team activity. So now I just want to talk a little bit about why, why this sheet exists. So as Daryl explained, part of the power that we really hope comes out of paradigm is the fact that we're going to encourage this communication amongst the theoreticians and the crystal growers and the characterization people. And as many of you know, that doesn't always happen quite as fluidly and smoothly as we would like it to. And communication is, is a big deal. And how you approach a problem and how you communicate can really affect the ability to discover new materials faster. And so what you're going to do is an experiment. This is my experiment for this summer. And I really want you to tell me if it worked for you or if it didn't. I hope it does. But what we've decided to do is in the evenings, there'll be sessions with Jack, who I'll introduce in a little bit, who will talk about teams and creativity and issues with teams. And what we wanted to try to do is how do we integrate this concept of how teams function with the scientific goals of paradigm? And so this is the idea that we've come up with. So I'll just let you all read that for a minute. So one of the things in your folder is the Tsunga paper. So that's your homework. So tonight, your homework is to read the Tsunga paper. There's a big addendum in the back of it of additional information. I don't know how important it is to read the whole mass of things, so don't despair. The paper itself is, is shorter. Uh, but between now and tomorrow night, the, the thought is that you've really read this paper. Um, one note to make is that that paper list certain materials, but I will send you this PowerPoint, so don't write things down. Uh, these are additional materials that you are allowed to consider. 
So tonight, Jack will give one talk, but then tomorrow night, so Monday night, Tuesday night, and Wednesday night, what you're going to do is you'll be given assignments, kind of in quotes, each night. So there'll be a session, and then for a half an hour or so, you can sit as a team and discuss, OK, tonight we have to make this decision. Tomorrow night we have to make this decision. And basically, what you're going to do over the next few nights is build this presentation. And so as a team, you're going to pick your material. And then this is all about going around that materials by design loop. So how are you going to grow it? How are you going to characterize it? How could the theory, how could it inform theory? And how could they use your results? And so you'll work through this process on Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday night. And then Thursday night, each team will basically, you're going to just make a slide. You're going to use this presentation as your template. I'll email it all to you. So Thursday night, everybody will have the same slide titles. And each team will give a 10-minute presentation. So we'll learn which material you chose and what your methodology was to study it. So that's all that I had for that. So that's the big picture of what this team activity is. Does anybody have any questions about that? OK, so the next thing I'd like to do is to introduce Jack Gonzalo, who until very recently was a Cornell faculty in uh, industrial labor relations. And he has very recently changed affiliation. And I'll let him tell you about that. But he is our director of creative environments for Paradigm. And we'll have now the first team session. Um, so I should start with a disclaimer. Daryl said he could make your dreams come true. I myself can't. So I should start by warning you uh, <laughs> that nothing that spectacular will happen. But, um, I'm a, my background is in psychology, as uh, Julie mentioned, and um, I'm really sort of obsessed with the creative process. And it's been what I do research on and teach for the last 15 years. And the part of innovation that I'm most interested in is the part that involves interaction between people. So let me just pull up my. So a lot of times people assume that uh, we form teams uh, made of diverse people and you put them together and everything they know that's unique will just be combined to create something new. Um, and that this innovation process should just unfold naturally, right? So one of the themes that I'm gonna talk about this week and what I really wanna convey is that when you get people in a group uh, to work together, things get uh, messed up very quickly and easily. And so what I wanna do is give you some concrete um, ideas about what can, the problems that can arise when people attempt to work together in teams and then give you some solutions uh, for how to deal with those and overcome those barriers. Um, my view of creativity is I don't subscribe to the myth of the lone genius. Uh, in my field, uh, when we started studying creativity, people were obsessed with the idea that creative ideas happen when geniuses are alone, you know, sort of working on problems. Um, but in fact, I think that you can, you can change the context to make everybody more creative than they normally would be, as long as you understand how the process works. So um, what Daryl mentioned um, in, in his introduction about uh, not relying on serendipity, that there's a process. I very much believe that's the case uh, for creativity as well. So that'll be uh, one of the themes of the week is uh, what are the problems that occur in teams and what are some specific suggestions for how to deal with them? Um, one, of the, one of the other things I want to say right from the start is, of course, uh, I'm not too familiar with your specific context. Um, well, I'm going to talk about the creative process in a very general way, uh, but I'm really hoping to interact with you and connect what I'm saying to what actually happens on your, uh, on your teams when you attempt to be creative and generate innovative solutions. Um, so I'm really relying on that dialogue with you, uh, not only um, for you to learn more, I hope, but also for me to learn more about uh, how you do your work, because uh, that's also very interesting to me. Um, a second uh, point I want to make, too, is that, um, and you'll see this very soon, is that I don't like to just stand up and talk about creativity. I actually do exercises that are intended to mimic parts of the creative process and sort of model what can go wrong and give us some fodder for discussion. So um, I really appreciate your participation. If anything's unclear, raise your hand, of course. I'm happy to take questions at any point. Um, and I'm hoping to do a lot of hands-on things this week. I know it's, uh, it's Sunday, it's the evening. Uh, we're tired, the crazy psych professor is in his Bermuda shorts. Um, I was promised that um, 
that the video you'd Photoshop a pair of pants on me. I didn't know I was going to be videotaped uh, today, so I'm going to hide behind the podium maybe more than I normally would, <laughs> just out of modesty. Um, so like I, like I opened with, uh, there's this widespread idea that teams are a source of creativity, and you see this in a wide range of organizations, that um, organizations form teams with the intention of generating solutions that would be better than any one individual could have generated alone, that there's somehow some benefit to leveraging the power of teams. And this is a very common uh, kind of assumption you'll see in many organizations. Um, I actually want to test this assumption out with a little exercise um, that I'd like you to do in your activity team. So it's my understanding that you're in groups of five, or is that right? Well, Assigned? They're not, well, they just have, but they're not, do you want them to sit that way down? Yeah, may yeah. as well. They can so get to know have, each other. So, if, okay, so if you look at your list, um, I'll put group one here, group two here, group three, four, five. And I think there are five total, right? So if, six, okay, then six is there. Yeah, just one. Okay, so. Each group should have one brainstorming sheet. I'd like you to pick one person to record ideas, preferably someone who has the best handwriting, uh, or at least legible. Um, and you're gonna have 10 minutes to respond to this brainstorming question. So a couple of rules. Actually, the main thing to, to keep in mind, what we're looking for here is quantity. I don't want one solution with an essay about why this solution's the best. It's, you're supposed to say as many ideas as you can in this 10 minute brainstorming period. And then at the end, I'll give you further instructions. So remember, quantity is what we're after here, not necessarily quality. Welcome crazy ideas. This is just a, uh, you know, a session to get as many ideas on the table as possible, and then we'll discuss them. So, um, so uh, your groups can start now, and you'll have 10 minutes. Now your group, you're gonna hate me, but I want you to brainstorm alone. So you, without talking to each other, come up with as many possible ideas to this prompt as you can in 10 minutes. Yeah. All right. <laughs> oh. So what I asked uh, the group in the front to do is brainstorm ideas alone and then add them together. So we're going to hear about what the results of that are. Um, and what you just went through is a typical uh, brainstorming uh, exercise um, that many organizations use uh, with the idea that if I assemble a face-to-face -face group and let them talk, um, that very creative ideas are going to result from the discussion. Um, the problem is, and we'll see if we replicated this in the class, most of the time we do, um, is that face-to-face -face groups typically underperform compared to groups that work alone and then combine their ideas. So there's something about the interaction that causes problems as groups attempt to be creative. And the reality is that face-to-face -face groups are not only less productive, but they're less creative. They come up with less novel ideas than groups that brainstorm alone and then combine. So I'm um, just curious what your, we'll see if we, what's your group total? How many? Okay, 47. Did any face-to-face -face group <laughs> come up with 47? Uh, what, how many? Yeah, you guys are like a rock star face-to-face -face group. <laughs> so that's great. So what are some other numbers? 23. 14, 34. 34, that's pretty good, yeah, 26. You guys actually did really well on average. What was that? <laughs> yeah, so there's no way to, to, that's a great question. There's no way that we could really tell that right now. Uh, but looking at the, all the research that's been done on this, even if you eliminate repeats, um, it's very typical that, that uh, these nominal groups, what we call groups who work alone and then combine, uh, just do better uh, in terms of numbers. And so the more typical comparison is 47 to 20 something. That's the really in the research, the typical. Um, you guys, for whatever reason, had something about your process was really on. Um, and I'd love to hear what, how your experience mapped on to what we did. Um, but your two groups looked like you were just having a great time back there and the ideas were just coming out. Uh, so that was, <laughs> so maybe there. So does any group have an idea they really thought was good? I'm just curious what. There were some funny ideas, like, <laughs> like you just think this is a clever idea. I'd actually think I want a you'd want a unicorn there, <laughs> right? So, so <laughs> viable, right? So that is one disclaimer about creativity: is that when we're talking about creative ideas, uh, they're ideas that are both novel and feasible in some way, or useful or solve a problem. 
<laughs> no, they didn't. So, okay. so what's the idea? <laughs> Plus, hey, it's, su it's Sunday, it's hot, right? We're gonna get weird ideas. But weirdness is part of the process. And that was, that's the whole point of brainstorming. When I say focus on quantity, um, the reason you do that is because the more ideas you come up with, the more likely you are to come up with the creative idea purely by accident. And a lot of ideas do emerge when you're working through, coming through, you know, searching through solutions, you end up hitting on something that really is good and uh, that's a good, clever idea. Are there any other ones that you would endorse as good? Yeah. Oh, that's good. Is that the process you use? Because you come here. Yeah. Break it down into what are the things that are bugging you. Yeah. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, that's a great. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So it is. It's helpful to to understand the parameters of the problem first, right, before you go in and start generating ideas. And you may often come up with ideas that are different starting that way compared to starting in some other way. Do you have another follow up? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> right. So there's a difficult step of take ownership of the problem. Right, and also seeing things from other people's perspective. Um, and we're going to talk actually about hierarchy, power, and status um, this week. And they are sometimes good for creativity, sometimes very bad. And, and I think your Dean example is really uh, a good one. And we're going to talk about how power changes the way people think in ways that have implications for creativity. And so we're going to get to that actually. Uh, remind me of that when we get to it. Um, so I'm kind of curious if your group came up with a lot, did you have one that you think would be sort of worth pursuing? I heard beer over there. I thought that was a good idea. <laughs> yeah, open bar. Yeah, open bar. Yeah. yeah, so maybe high on novelty, low on feasibility. <laughs> but you had quantity, so that's great. So, so the point I want to make here is that um, on average, and, and you guys are an exception, but on average, um, groups working alone do better. So what is it about the interaction that impeded the free exchange of creative ideas. And so that's what I want to really talk about, um, talk about what those problems are. Um, and one of the first uh, people to recognize the problems that arise in brainstorming groups was actually um, an advertising executive who wrote a book in the 1950s uh, called Applied Imagination. And this became sort of a roadmap for um, everyone who was interested in brainstorming from that point forward. He actually coined the term brainstorm and he set out a list of rules that he claimed, if you follow these rules, you're gonna generate twice as many ideas as you would have had you worked alone. And so the ideas I think are worth, the, the rules are worth considering now, even though as I'm gonna say, really they don't work that well. Um, but the first one is exactly what I told you to do, emphasize quantity. So you wanna come up with as many ideas as you can, the logic being that you're capitalizing on chance. If you come up with a lot of ideas, something good is gonna come up uh, just as part of that process. Um, don't criticize each other. And I don't know if this came up in your group, so you're pointing, what was an example of a criticism that came no, up? No, we did really good. Oh, you, you know, did well. Those hands, you know, those hands, there's also on my list. Oh, okay, all right, so. <laughs> so <laughs> and then I made fun of you guys, which I broke my own rule. <laughs> so unicorns and pandas. Um, that's actually, you were following the, a good process, right? Because uh, when people feel comfortable sharing unusual ideas, you get more creative solutions. They're, they're more willing to diverge from uh, whatever it is people typically suggest. So that's important. Um, and then at a later stage, you can always filter those ideas out, right? So it turns out unicorns, you probably can't find one, right? So we can eliminate that. Um, but there may be other good things that came out in this atmosphere where people felt free to say whatever. Was there any criticisms in your group? Um, I heard one blatant praise. So in your group, you're like, that's a great idea, sort of. So this is a very positive group, so I think everybody was. But as we'll, get, as we'll see, criticism can come up on these teams, you know, um, on, especially on issues that aren't as trivial as this one that I asked you to think about. Um, and you want to welcome unusual ideas, so when people really take a risk and, and suggest something crazy, you want to say like, oh, good job, you know, really, you know, that's, I hadn't thought of that, that's, you know, uh, welcome unusual ideas. And then you want to look for opportunities to combine your ideas with others. And so that's where you realize the benefits of a group. Um, someone suggested a panda, and the panda made me think of uh, a rug. And then maybe the lounge could use a rug, right, uh, for people to be more comfortable. And so that's where you get those 
um, I, and I hate this word, consultants use this word, synergies, and I, and I want to rip my own head off for even saying it. But that's really what we're talking about, or you know, realizing opportunities to capitalize on the ideas of others, combine ideas. Um, so what went wrong? What, why is this um, sort of ideal so unlikely to happen? Um, one of the basic ones is something called production blocking. And the reality of face-to-face -face groups is that you can't talk over each other. Um, and so while one person's uh, speaking, everyone else is waiting to speak. And there's a lot of research showing that we lose ideas in that process. So while I'm waiting for you to finish, suddenly I think, well, maybe the idea I had isn't so relevant now that the conversation has moved on. Or I had an idea and I completely forgot because I was listening to your idea. And we all know there are people in groups who like to hear themselves speak and go on and on and on and on, right? And so while you're waiting for this impolite person to uh, seed the floor, uh, you've forgotten a bunch of ideas. Um, and so production blocking can, can be a problem. In, uh, among groups who are working alone and then combining, obviously there were no constraints. You could write down whatever you want. And so that's uh, possibly one thing uh, that could, that could um, impede this creative process. And that's a really simple one. Um, the next one's a bit trickier. And you, you may or may not have noticed this in your groups, but um, free writing or social loafing happens when you put people in a face-to-face -face group and ask them to work together. And we've all been part, a part of groups that have done this, right? So everybody knows that as we're generating ideas here, you know, you can't really count how many ideas I'm contributing to the group. It's not really possible to, to track each individual's contribution. So I can just pull back a little bit because I know that, um, you know, the group will kind of do the work for me. So the idea of many hands make light work, right? So the advantage of working in teams is it makes my life easier. Uh, what can happen though, and we're all conscientious people, or you would be here, is that you end up working on teams sometimes where uh, people really don't do anything. Um, and that social loafing can prevent the number of ideas uh, that would have ordinarily been shared, they end up being lost because people just aren't making the effort. And that's a particular problem in face-to-face -face teams. With the nominal team, you probably all felt individually accountable, right? Because I could come and see exactly how many ideas were on the page. And you could actually look over at your, at your team and see, wow, you're generating more than me. I better keep up, right? And I saw people glancing at each other's pages uh, as we were doing this, right? It's like, oh God, that person, I better you know, step it up. So that's an advantage of a, of a nominal team is that social loafing um, is much more difficult. Uh, it, it's less of a problem. The last one's actually the trickiest, I think, and, and we're gonna spend uh, tomorrow actually going into more depth on this particular one. Um, but it's also rooted in this rule, do not criticize. And the idea here is that people wanna be liked and accepted. You want to share an idea and, and have people say it's a good one, right? And people have this fear of being evaluated. They're, they don't like to be rejected or criticized. And so what happens when you're in a group where evaluation apprehension is high is that people withhold their most novel, interesting, creative, risky ideas and end up sharing the most mundane, conservative, careful ideas because those are less likely to attract negative attention. Those are less likely to be criticized. And so what you get when evaluation is high are people playing it safe and people uh, not diverging from what other people suggested. So one person says an idea and then another, someone else says, oh, I like that idea, I have one just like it. And so you get tiny incremental improvements, but you don't get people taking risks to make bold suggestions. Like let's put a, who was the first person in your group, right, to suggest something like a bar or beer or a unicorn or something really strange, right? It takes a bit of a risk. And, and so uh, sometimes it can be difficult uh, to be the person that does that. So um, these are the problems that research has shown uh, to be an issue, but I wanna give you some concrete suggestions for how to get around these problems. Um, the issue with production blocking is actually quite easy. Um, a lot of people choose to do a brainstorming session uh, by computer or, or you do a phase in which you work alone and then you come to a group meeting with all, everyone having done the brainstorming by themselves and then you share ideas. Um, or you could do it, uh, as I said, completely mediated by the computer where you can set it up so that I'm typing out ideas and I can see other people's ideas shared as, as I go. So there are easy logistical ways to get around production blocking. I think this is the simplest kind of uh, problem to deal with. Um, the way to get around social loafing, and this one 
this technique uh, is really good for boosting productivity really easily is if you're working in a face-to-face -face team, what you do is you divide up the sheet into columns and put one person's name at the top of each column. And then every time somebody suggests an idea, their idea goes in their own column. And that way people feel individually accountable for their output. And so in any kind of team, uh, that's really crucial, assigning tasks and knowing what each person is supposed to be accountable to the group for. Um, and if you do that, uh, social loafing typically stops being a problem fairly easily. Um, the last one uh, around evaluation apprehension is actually uh, a bit trickier. Um, and the rule that says do not criticize often doesn't work. Um, because if you think about it, there are all kinds of nonverbal ways and subtle ways to signal to people that their idea isn't very good. Um, like, can you think of examples of that? Like, how do you, if you hear an idea in a group that you think is not very good, um, even if you're not, even if you don't say that's a stupid idea, that's what people think of when they think of criticism. But what tends to happen in a group when silence, right? So your idea kind of goes into a void, right? <laughs> so uh, are there any other uh, ways of signaling it? Yeah, but that's a good example. Rolling your eyes. Yeah, rolling your eyes. So that's the classic marker of contempt in a social interaction. Um, and somebody always suggests that as a nonverbal, right? Uh, whenever I talk about this, and it reminds me of this study I really love, uh, looking at married couples who are in therapy over a 10-year period. And these researchers actually counted the number of eye rolls in, their, in these therapy sessions at year one, and it significantly predicted divorce 10 years later, better than any other variable. And so these sort of verbal signals of contempt are really powerful, and it's really hard to, to withhold those by just saying don't criticize. Uh, you can sigh, you can groan, you can ignore, you can, uh, you know, you can impose silence. Uh, there are all kinds of ways uh, to signal it. So how do we then reverse this uh, tendency to be afraid of what other people think? And that's gonna be a theme I wanna turn to uh, over the next couple of days. But just to give you a preview, we're gonna talk uh, about the role that narcissists can play in groups. And I'm actually gonna give you a personality measure and you'll know where you stand on narcissism. It turns out that although narcissists are really uh, trouble in a lot of ways, uh, for the creative process they can actually be uh, fairly useful. So we'll talk about uh, where that comes from. Uh, we'll also talk about norms in groups that can permit greater creativity uh, if you follow them. So how do you uh, set the expectations for behavior in groups that sort of liberate people to take chances and risks um, and be creative. And so we'll talk about what those are. Um, and we'll also again talk about hierarchy. Um, hierarchy is extremely important. It emerges quickly. It can be informal, but hierarchies also shape the way people think. And depending where you are on the hierarchy, um, the hierarchy can be either constraining or liberating. Um, and so given that we work in teams where hierarchies are present, we have to think about uh, how those impact the creative process. So um, I actually don't want to keep you uh, later than this, uh, but I think this is a, was a good introduction of where, of where we're headed this week. Um, but I just want to say uh, for, for tomorrow, there's a small chance I'll send you a short handout over email uh, between now and then. So please check your email. Um, if you don't get it, it's fine. I, I haven't decided if I want to share it with you, but, uh, but I just want to say um, check your email for that. And um, I will see you on Monday. And then I'll hand it over to you guys, unless that concludes. Yep. Okay, so have a good night. <laughs> See you.